Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and a very good morning. Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Haslina Abdullah, Director of Institute for Social Science Studies, IPSAS, University Putra Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Sulaiman Derin, Faculty of Theology, Marmara University, Turkey. Yang berbahagia Brother Syed Jamaluddin Miri, the executive director and also a co-founder of International Student of Islamic Psychology or ISIP, management and senior staff of UPM, directors, deans, lecturers, government agency representative, NGOs, embassies representative, notable guests, and not to forget our online viewers. Mini love to you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Knowledge Discourse or in Bahasa, we call it Wacana Ilmu, entitled Sufi Psychology from the Perspective of Al-Ghazali and Rumi, presented by our distinct guest speaker, Prof. Dr. Suleiman Derin, Faculty of Theology, Mamara University, Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, to bless our ceremony this morning, let us recite Umul Kitab Al-Fatiha. Amin, amin, ya Rabbal Alamin. InsyaAllah, um, Allah will bless our ceremony this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's welcome Prof. Dr. Hasida Abdullah to moderate our knowledge discourse session this morning. Prof. Hasina, I pass to you under your guidance and the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Zai. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning, everyone. Um, so we are blessed here today, this morning, um, since our brothers, Pro Professor Dr. Sulaiman is here with us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to delve into the intricate working of the human mind and explore the fascinating realms of psychology through Al-Ghazali and Rumi. Um, which will be presented by our esteemed professor, Dr. Professor Sulaiman from Marmara University. I will uh, introduce a little bit uh, of uh, Professor Sulaiman. Um, she, he, he is he graduated for, from Faculty of Theology, Marmara University. What uh, interests me is that his title, PhD title, is towards some paradigms on the Sufi conception of love. Um, unfortunately, the topic is not today, eh? about love is not today, but it's about Al-Ghazali and Rumi. Explores the various perspectives on love within Sufism with special reference to psychology. And um, he also hosts a popular weekly radio program called Sufism and Human Psychology, which has been running for the past six years. And the program serves as a platform to explore the intersection of Sufism and psychology. I mean, all this while, when we talk about Sufism, my, my mind is, apart from the Sufi, the very pious uh, person and whatnot, and when I relate it to Turkish, I remember the dance. They call it Sufi dance. I, I, I don't know whether I'm right or not. Yeah. Sama, yeah. Okay, so without further ado, we welcome Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Haslinda. I'm really happy to be here with my Malaysian brothers and sisters. I love Malaysia. It's a beautiful country, you know. And my connection started in 1995 with your uh, Minister of Religious Affairs, you know, uh, Ustaz uh, Mohamed Mayim Mukhtar. So I know all the Malaysian food, all the shrimps you eat and everything. Um, yes, I forget some of it, of course. So, uh, the, you know, psychology is interesting. Psychology means uh, the knowledge of soul. So when we translate into Arabic, ilm nafs But now, they have omitted nafs, soul, from the equation. Now just they just say body and mind. You know, we have body, we have mind. Where is the soul? 
trouble is they don't accept us nowadays, unfortunately. They say everything is happening in your brain. Or hormones, you know, that serotonin and other stuff make us happy or sad. And uh, now let me tell you a story from Rumi. I love mixing Rumi and Ghazali when I teach Sufism. Uh, as you're writing, sister, an aunt came back to its nest and said, I have seen today an in interesting instrument. It draws nice pictures, you know. It's got pen. It's beautiful. It's very nice. And another clever and said, you know, it's not the pen it's, it writes. It is the hand which keeps the pen, you know. More clever and said, no, no, it's not the hand. It is the arm draws the pictures, not the pen, not the hand. And of course, more clever person came and said, it is the head, the mind. So today in psychology, we had this problem, you know. Uh, there is D.B. Watson, a uh, cognitive therapist. He says, we are no different than the ox we slaughter. So we are in the same. We are with the apes and dogs and mice, you know. Unfortunately, today, it's very sad. They make tests on mice in laboratories, on apes, and they apply this to human beings. Um, they are comparing the mice and the dog and the ape to human beings, which are the best of creation. So, Sufis have very deep knowledge. Of course, this first Sufi lab, sorry, sorry, the first uh, psychology lab was established in 18 something. Yeah, in Leipzig, yeah. So, very, very recent when we look at the history of humankind. So, we didn't have anything about soul in the past. How did we treat? psychological sicknesses. We get all different methods in Sufi circles. I recently uh, plan, uh, plan to write an article how to uh, cure narcissism from a Sufi perspective. You know, when you look at the modern psychology today, they say when you have a narcissist friend or spouse, just escape, don't turn back. There's no cure. Whereas in Sufism, we have cure for narcissist people. So Sufis and uh, Muslim scholars for centuries they had information from the Holy Quran. Allah says in the Holy Quran, you have been given very little knowledge concerning the soul. Therefore today people reject it. Because they don't have enough information, they can't test, they can't touch the soul in the lab. So they say it doesn't exist. It exists. It exists, but not, uh, you know, in the material realm. It is in the, you know, uh, spiritual realm. So, Sufis, for centuries, almost a thousand years, they learned from the Quran and Sunnah. On top of that, they added their own observations in the Sufi lodges because they were training, they were making Seyri Suluk in the Sufi lodge. So we have so much psychological information in books like Ihya Ulumuddin, Kimer Saadet, like books of uh, Mavlana Jalatin Rumi. Uh, he wrote, you know, in uh, Persian. For my friend Jamalutin is. So he speaks very good Persian. So, you know, all these books have really are treasures that needs to be, you know, uh, investigated and studied. So, where is my... Yeah, okay, sorry. Nur, can you please share your bank account and everything? All your uh, S-words. Thank you. Enable editing. Okay. So, I have special interest in Ihya Ulumuddin. When I have read Ya Ulumuddin, the third and fourth volume especially, my dear friends, the first two volumes are more about, you know, Ilmihal, prayer, fasting, and uh, other things. But third and fourth volume are really psychological. Me and uh, a professor, Subandi from Jack Jakarta, we have uh, written an article comparing DSM-5 
with uh, vices, Razail of Al Ghazali. And we reached very interesting results. Like Ghazali mentions uh, 500 times anger, Qadab, in other connotations of the word. And DSM 5 is like around 600, very close numbers. Again, narcissism, kibir. So, whatever is a sickness, a disorder, as a term of Razila, immoral uh, characteristic in Sufism, is also a psychological disorder. Because Islam is a religion of nature, putra. So Islam is a natural and logical religion. Whenever we say something is bad, it's really bad. Alhamdulillah, as Muslims, you know, uh, we are so lucky that uh, we can give the whole world uh, a lot of new and fresh information. For example, now they discuss the center of the our existence. Is it brain? Is it what? Is it or heart or soul? So Ghazali is using heart and soul synonymously. For him, heart means not the flesh in our uh, body, but the spiritual heart. So, in his understanding, <clears throat> the heart, the soul, is the center of our existence, our personality. Not our nafs, amara, not, not our ego, not our brain, not our mind, but it is our, you know, uh, soul. And he uses the hadith, there is a piece of flesh in the body, if it is healthy, the whole body is healthy. If it becomes unhealthy, the whole body get, gets unhealthy, that's the heart. But the, of course, actually, this hadith is a miracle. It is true for physical as well as psychological, you know, physiological meaning, because if someone is, has a problem with his or her heart, he has difficulty in his life. So, in his uh, understanding, the heart is the uh, master, and he gives a good example of a rider and a horse. A horse, which is our body, and our rider is our, uh, you know, heart. Actually, I found a better example than Al Ghazali, the computer. Now we use the computer. Computer has so much, you know, uh, interesting uh, characteristics. It can make calculations, draw pictures, do translations. Mashallah, computers are so clever, smart. But we are the one who use it, you know. We can use it in a bad way or in a good way. So we have to train our heart, train our soul. Then the question comes, can we train our soul? Yes. Ghazali says we can even train animals, you know. Animals learn. A dog learns how to hunt. A parrot learns how to talk. So, you know, if animals can learn, and actually he has a very deep discussion of how can we change ourselves, because some people say, some psychologists people today, you know, you have genes of LGBTQ, so you have no problem. Because you have these genes, then it's okay. It's natural for you. Whatever gene they find in your body, then they say it's okay. You can go do it because it's not haram. It is not... Please, uh, okay, thank you. You know, so we have reason and sharia. Reason is not enough. If you put reason as the boss, the reason can justify anything, you know, anything. But sharia is, alhamdulillah, as Muslim psychology people, uh, we have easy uh, in terms of uh, saying this is good or bad. Like for LGBT, for example. Today, almost 99% LG psychology, people say it's okay. No problem. It's normal. It's natural. They even encourage it. They encourage gender transformation and, uh, you know, operations and divorce. Unfortunately, they defend it. Actually, my dear friend, uh, <clears throat> Human, you know Human Keshavarzi? I invited him. We have a family foundation in Istanbul fighting this LGBT stuff. It's a big movement all over the world. I don't know how strong they are in Malaysia. Maybe it's okay. You are better than us because we are close to Europe. 
everything comes first to us. You know, from Balkans, from Europe, every sickness comes to Turkey first. From Turkey, we send it to you, unfortunately. So I invited him to our, uh, you know, family foundation, and he said, if I join you, they will cancel my diploma. Yes, in USA, in many Western countries today, <clears throat> you can't uh, give a therapy to a LGBT person because it's illegal. You like years ago, a friend of mine from UK, he said, I want to bring uh, like 50 homosexuals to Turkey to treat them in Turkey. Can you find me a place? I said, I can't find a place for such people, you know, because we have Quranic schools and nice places. He said, because if I give therapy in UK, it is uh, illegal. Giving a therapy to a, even they want it, because they say, we want to change and we want to give up this sickness. You can't help them. It's illegal. So you see, why? Because they say it is re it is reasonable, it's logical to have this sickness. Alhamdulillah, we have Sharia. When we have difficulty, we look at the Quran, you know. So things change. I, unfortunately, the West became very relative, you know. Ustaz Malik Pedri, you know, of him, he said 50 years before it was a crime in UK, in USA, and there were clinics they who were treating, which were treating this sickness. Now, all of a sudden, it became uh, a crime. Now, uh, when I draw, there is no board here to draw. Never mind. I use the corner of this because I love it. Oh, can I write? Wow. I am amazed with the amount of technology in this country. First, these uh, <laughs> rotating chairs uh, struck my attention. Can I take one to Istanbul? Bismillah. Okay. Yeah, I will use that one. I love drawing this picture. So, Islamic psychology, in my opinion, we have Allah here, or creator. We have khalq, creation. And we have ilm nafs And you wonder what kind of drawing is it? So in my understanding, what I find from Islamic psychology is we have a horizontal dimension, we have a vertical dimension. The vertical dimension is our relationship with Allah. So Ghazali says, you know, good conduct is part of religion. So in some mystical developments, religions like Buddhism, like monasticism, you have only God here. You have your relationship with only Allah. You don't have family. You don't have, you know, social uh, relationships. So if you pray all night, you are a good person. In Islam, Ghazali says, good conduct, mu'amala, is a part of religion. Which means, uh, for a good balanced psychology, you have to have good relationship with Allah as well as with people, animals, with the nature, with everything. So if you have balanced way, we have, we have ilm al-nafs, al-islami. So if anyone is ignoring God, if you say, oh, you know, belief is something we don't discuss, you can't be a good psychologist. Someone wants to commit, for example, suicide. Oh, it's euthanasia. You call it euthanasia? And it's a very stupid Arabic translation. Did you know that? Al-Qatlul Rahim. Merciful killing. Come on. I mean, what, what is merciful killing? You kill someone by mercy? Al-Qatlul Rahim. Euthanasy. For example, can we have euthanasy? Mr. Hassel, I ask you. Would you uh, give fatwa? Why? It makes sense, actually. Look. If you have no God, if you have no religion, I lived 60, 70 years in a very healthy way. I went, visited Malaysia, Singapore, all these beautiful places around here. At 80, I became very sick. So I don't believe in hereafter. There is no 
life after death. Why do you suffer under 10 years, disabled, you know? Look, understand now? If you're a psychologist of secular orientation, now, unfortunately, I, very soon, I believe, when you go to hospital, they will ask you. You know, you have so and so sickness. If you can treat it, but it will cost you so much money, a hundred thousand dollars. Would you like to have some eternity? Free. Not here, of course, Malaysia. But in the West, now in Western countries, they are discussing it. Now, now people want it because they are, they are right, actually. If you don't believe in God, why you suffer? But as Muslims, you know, every second is so important for us. We never think of death. Because when you say, La ilaha illallah, it's you know, so heavy. On the scales, Imam Rabbani says, if you put the whole world, whole universe in one scale, just one La ilaha illallah, on the other one, La ilaha illallah will be heavier than everything was created. But for us, it doesn't make sense. Why? Because we are Muslims. Even when we are all old, like 90 years old, we say, La ilaha illallah, subhanallah, we pray. Therefore, you know, we don't need, we don't have to die. But actually, there's a hadith. Interesting, I like it. The Prophet says, no one of you should wish death, but if he really wants to die, or she wants to die, say, oh my Lord, if that is good for me, take my life. There's also some solution in Islam. You can't go to a doctor and ask eternity, but you can ask Allah, oh my Lord, if it is good for me to die, please take my life away. So, the Islamic, the Sufi psychology has this uh, creator, Alhamdulillah, which is so important. So many things are, you can't solve them. Like, you know someone, for example, I have seen a father, uh, the, like five years ago, there was a psychological conference. There was a father who lost his son, only son. He was always grieving and feeling very sad and everything. And one day, uh, an imam told him, your son became a bird in paradise. Don't worry. And his grief went away, you know. Otherwise, for secular people, it's really big loss. You know, someone you really love, for Muslims, we believe we will meet again. It's not an uh, eternal separation. This is just a for short time, you know. And actually, they have calculated man's life span like few seconds in terms of the universal clock. Because imagine all these uh, stars and galaxies are there for billions of years. So your life, my life, like 50, 60 years old, like five seconds, six seconds. So Alhamdulillah, we believe we will meet our loved ones, you know, or parents or siblings, whatever we lost. Actually, I developed, or I am trying to develop other uh, therapy methods with stories of prophets from the Quran. Like if you have, uh, if you lost a son, take the example of, uh, you know, Nuh uh, also he lost his son as a disbeliever, as well as Yaqub he lost it, you know, uh, their kids. Abducted or pushed the you pushed Yusuf into a well. So actually, the Quran has therapies for all kind of disorders, all kind of loss. If you are terminally ill, look at say Sayyidina Ayub salam. If you are extremely rich and you don't know what to do with the money, look at which prophet? My prophet Sulaiman Ali salam. He was so rich, and uh, you know. Uh, but he was a still good man. He was a, still an exemplary person. So in Islam, we have such a rich culture in our Quran, in our uh, Hadith books. But unfortunately, we don't use it. We just, uh, you know, uh, let me just, what is it? Yeah. For example, Ghazali speaks of four, four values. Like there's no religion here. Look at it. Nur, did you realize you have a mistake here? Patience. Nur has prepared this, so it's... Okay. Wisdom. Uh, hikmah. Courage. Patience. Justice. Aren't they very similar to Martin Seligman's core values? He also says the same thing. Courage. Justice. Humanity. Temperance. Wisdom. And transcendence. 
Of course, Gazali is very transcendental. We always speak about so it doesn't have to mention it. So the modern psychology has borrowed many things from Islamic texts. You know Rani Awad? She is from the United States. Mr. Rani Awad has the first Muslim lab. Which country, brother uh, Jamalatin? Where does she live? Chicago? Stanford University, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. She has a lab for Muslims. So, for example, she's testing. Yeah. You know, she has written an article on uh, Abu Zuhail Balkhi. Yes, and when people saw it, they said, this will change the history of psychology. Because the history of psychology starts with the Western peoples. They never mention any Muslim name. No Abu Zuhail Balkhi, no Yom Ghazali, no Ibn Sina. That started someone in, like Freud, who lived very recently, you know. And actually, I won't have time to discuss it, but I have also a story <clears throat> in Ghazali, in Rumi, in his Mesnavi. Uh, he is doing psychoanalysis. Really, very detailed psychoanalysis. Rumi. Yes, if I show this poetry to you, it's in the second uh, story of, uh, if you can Google it, in the first volume of Mesnavi, the second story, The Slave Girl. The name of the story is Slave Girl. You know, Rumi is teaching us how to make, you know, psychoanalysis. Very detailed way. So they say Freud has invented it. It's wrong, you know. He didn't invent it. The Western, you know, I have written a book on Orientalism, British Orientalism. And uh, like the last thousand years, the British said, whichever, uh, you know, ship go to India or Malaysia, should bring at least two copies of, uh, two different copies of manuscripts. One in Persian, one in Arabic. So you have thousands of thousands of volumes of manuscripts today in London, in Paris, in Berlin. And some of these manuscripts, we don't have them in Islamic countries. They are lost. They have taken it. And we don't have the similar uh, manuscripts in our countries. Why? Because they knew that Muslims have so much knowledge in many different things. Alhamdulillah, as Muslims, whenever we borrow a information from any book, we admit it. You know, we say this is from uh, so and so. Yes. You know, his parma. Martin Seligman has came up with this parma, positive emotions. No, he, he, for positive emotions, yeah, M is meaning uh, emo, perma, M is meaning A is achievement. Okay? So, I wonder why don't we produce such powerful paradigms ourselves? We have so much knowledge. When you look at the history of psychology, it's all about Jews, you know. Freud was a Jew. Okay? Viktor Frankl, Abraham Maslow, Ibrahim Maslow, yani. So they always come up with these interesting things. Why, in my opinion, because of Judaism. Of course, at the end of their Ahli Kitab, even it is corrupted, they have some knowledge about the soul. Of course, the Western Christians, because of Christianity is against human nature, the corrupted Christianity, I mean, they lost their hope in Christianity. Martin Seligman says, his uh, concept of original sin was dragged into psychology by Freud. He says this uh, rotten to the core philosophy of original sin. From where you have this? It is, it is unnatural. It is illogical. We have a little baby. We love babies, isn't it? They have smell from paradise. But in Christianity, until they are baptized, they are evil. They have sin. Come on. In Islam, uh, which chapter? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. No one will carry other people's sins. What was, which verse was it? Okay. This is Vizra Ukra. Yeah, this is what Islam says, you know. And in Islam, again, we come to this Khalik, Allah. We have correct information by Allah given to us in the Holy Quran that, you know, He has forgiven uh, Adam and Hawa, alayhim as salam. But there is no original sin. Salaka Adam Rabbi Bikelmat, yeah. Allah 
gave sent them and Adam received some words. He learned them, he repeated them, they were forgiven. In Christianity, marriage is immoral. Better not marry. Be single like a monk, a nun. But if you divorce, sorry, if you marry, no divorce. Again, all extreme cases. No marriage, once married, no divorce. Is it logical? Imagine a couple, cat and dog in the same house, and you tell them, no, you, you can't divorce. I think if I am not wrong, Henry VIII killed eight ladies because he was a Catholic and he was the king. You know, so if you block the natural path, there will be crimes and sins. In my opinion, why there is so much, uh, you know, zina in the West is because for centuries they looked down on marriage. They didn't, uh, you know, honor marriage as a good institution. Therefore, the West is now in horrible chaos, you know. Single moms everywhere. There are no parents, no fathers. You know, why? Because of Christianity. So unnatural. People followed it for centuries. They couldn't find any goodness in it and they left it. Now, the psychological world is under the, you know, Jewish control. I'm not conspiracy theorist here, but when you look at the big fathers of uh, psychology today, even today, they are mostly Jews. And I wonder why don't we don't replace them? We have better, more logical solutions for everything. I was uh, visiting some countries in, in this corona time. They said, you know, the Muslim prophet says, Prayer is not enough. Hygiene is important. We wash our hands all the time. And in Corona time, they said always wash your hands and, you know, mouth and stuff. Hygiene. We, we were in Australia with my brother Jamaluddin, a beautiful country. A lot of kangaroos around. You don't have kangaroos here, don't you? No kangaroos here? You don't have kangaroos. Okay. In bottles, it is written, you know, Prophet Muhammad says, that even near a river, don't waste the water. The Prophet said, when you make ablution from a river, don't waste the water. What does it mean? Don't use too much water, you know, because it becomes an custom. Then you go home, you know. Once I had some visitors um, from somewhere, we were sitting. So they didn't see us. Anyone who comes, they always shut down the lights. We open it, they shut down. Someone passing by, because they don't see it from outside, they think there's no one inside. As Alhamdulillah, this is an Islamic character, you know? We are against wasting things. Islam is so natural, so logical. Whatever thing is Muharramad in Islam has some logics in it. Can you define alcohol? Can you define, for example, uh, you know, drugs, gambling? Islam is the cure, also in psychology. LGBTQ stuff as well. Sometimes, the psychology people, they have no divine, uh, what you call it, vahi, so they stuck in the mud. They don't know what to do. As Muslims, we can immediately say this is haram, this is illegal, marriage, you know what you call it, uh, you cannot live as a girlfriend, boyfriend, these are all haram. But other religions, don't have, they don't have the answer because they are extremist. For example, take Judaism, how to eat, so many thousands of problems, so many rules. You know, so people give up. So uh, Ghazali is discussing here in Islam, we believe that we can have a change. Actually, when I translate Tauba, I like translating it as positive change. We always make Tauba. Okay. And I never killed someone, I never drink alcohol. Why do I make Tauba? Because it's a positive change, you know. You always try to be. Best version of yourself. Still, Alhamdulillah, all of us need to make some tawbah. Why? Maybe we are wasting our, our time, you know. We are gossiping sometimes, knowingly, unknowingly, you know. Maybe we are wasting something, water or light or air conditioning. You leave it alone, you know, open. No one asks you why did you leave it open. In Malaysia, it's okay. But, you know, if you are leaving house like 10 hours, I don't know if it's okay to leave it open, you know. In I heard in Pakistan, we go to a restaurant, a 
and eat like two, three hours, the car is working. You don't stop it. It's uh, showing that you are rich. You don't care for the fuel. I even uh, stopped my car in the red lights, like 20 seconds. Of course, this is extreme, I'm joking. But you know, uh, really Muslims have the best of everything in psychology, in physical medicine, in the philosophy, in everything, you know. But the only thing is we are lazy. We don't bring up these jewels out of the uh, Quran and Sunnah and uh, other, you know, Islamic texts. No eradication, but moderation. I think you like this. As I said, always the middle path. So shall we eradicate our anger? I think Malaysians don't they don't get angry at all. Really? I have never seen an angry Malaysian in my life. And Turks very aggressive. When we drive, we like fighting, you know. When I bring uh, guests from airport, I tell them, sit in the back seat, you know. You'll be scared. The way we drive, like you know, it is I, I like driving here, very very nice, very calm. In Istanbul, it's not like that. You know. So Ghazali says. Find the moderation in your emotions. And even I love his, uh, you know, explaining of istikama. What's istikama? You know, remember the verse, uh, no, hadith, Shayabatni Suratu Hud. The Prophet says, The chapter Hud made me old. And they ask, Which commandment made you old? He said, Festagim kema umurta. Be straight as you are commanded. And Ghazali says, being straight for a prophet is very easy. The difficulty is you're balanced in your istikama. Like someone committed a crime, how much you will give punishment, you know? Someone stole, for example. Someone cursed someone. How shall we? Shall we kill the guy? Is it balanced? You know, punishment? No. So finding the balance, you go and someone ask you money, a beggar. In Mecca, Medina, everyone, Moshe, so many beggars. You you give all your money. Is it balanced? No. But if you sell, if you send all your money now to Gaza, it's okay. It's balanced because people need the money. But you don't give the money, you know, to any ordinary beggar in the street because you know they made it like a business. So finding the balance is the problem. Otherwise, prophets are always straightforward, pious people, you know. They know uh, the best of everything. But finding, imagine now I give you the example of the Prophet was always smiling. You will see his teeth smiling, you know, all the time. But once he was talking to the you know leaders of Meccan Mushriks, and Abdullah bin Mektub came to ask some questions. He was a believer, you know. Probably the Prophet said, now you go away, I talk to you later. Now I am trying to earn the hearts of these non-believers, you know. And he frowned at him. And Allah said, this is unbalanced. You shouldn't talk to mushriks. You should talk to this blind mu'min because he wants to learn something from you. So psychologically, I think, if people come to us, some really want to learn, some really don't care, we should prioritize those who want to learn, for example. So, you know, uh, Ghazali always in, in his uh, vices and razail uh, and fadail, he defends the middle path in our emotions. What he says, someone is made angry and he doesn't become angry, he's a donkey. He says, from Imam Shafi. Yes, he says, Imam Shafi, you have been forced to be angry. Yeah, like someone attacking your family. And you don't get angry? It's bad. He says, you must be angry and defend your country. Like the people in Gaza now, mashallah. You know, so anger, whatever emotion was given to us, it's necessary. For example, greed. Do we need greed? I think we need, but not in the material sense, in the spiritual sense, you know. So benefiting others all the time. It's a greed, kind of, but it's a spiritual greed. 
We need anger. We need love. We need hate. We need all these emotions. But Ghazali is teaching us how to find the and actually, I love this example. Eat and drink. I had a friend. He was very fat, like 150 kilos. You know, very large, mashallah. I told him, Ahmed, why don't you stop eating? He loved eating. He said, I am following the commandment of the Holy Quran. I said, what's this? He says, I said, can you go on a little bit? He said, I am not half of the Quran. I don't know the rest of the verse. Well, I As well as in our emotions, in our actions, we need to find the, you know, uh, the middle path. I love this. Like, when we have someone to, uh, you know, uh, give therapy, he says, the first, the men are of the fourth class. First people, the first class of people, they don't distinguish between truth and falsehood. But when you teach them, they will learn. They will accept it. Like many people in the West today, they don't know why alcohol is bad. They never heard alcohol is bad. They all all their lifetime they have seen their parents drinking or dancing or whatever the bad thing here. So we teach them. Some of them accept it. So if people accept their mistakes, nafs lavama level, it is very easy to help them. The second class of man can accept the evil actions as bad but are not accustomed to good actions. So some people, they know good is good, bad is bad. But they, they're not accustomed to good things, you know. So Ghazali says you can still help them, but this is a little bit more difficult, you know. The third class, believe bad conducts to be good and the norm. So we have trouble here. Therefore, I am telling, uh, when we give therapy to people, uh, about anything, the first thing should be cognitive therapy. You should go to Quran and Sunnah and teach people why it is bad. Why? Why it is bad? Gamble. Why it is bad to be angry to other people? Why it is bad to be narcissist? Now, Kibir. And actually, Ghazali is really interesting. He's explaining every single thing in a very big detail. And you wonder how, from where he got all this information. Like he's writing hundred pages on anger. How people get angry, why people get angry, and what happens physiologically. He says, you know, when you get angry with someone, the, the reason of anger is first thing. He said, first he thought anger is from shaitan and from fire. When you get angry, you get heated, your face becomes red, the blood rushes into your brain. You know, first thing is from shaitan. Second thing, he says, you get angry because when you want to reach something, and people say, no, I won't drink water. If someone prevents me from the water, I get angry. But I need the water. And he says, if the person you get angry with is stronger than you, your blood go in. You, you become pale and white. But if the person is equal or less than you, then blood rushes into your, your brain and face, and you become reddish and fight. Fight or flight. Remember? The first one was flight. Someone is more powerful than you. You are in the mood of flight. So, you know, actually, I say, you know, the Holy Quran is even teaching us uh, the level uh, how we should fear, what things we can fear, and what things we shouldn't fear. For example, Bismillah. Musa alayhi salam, when Allah said, Astaghfirullah, ma fi yaminika ya Musa, qalihi asai, atabakku alayha, wa ahu shubiha ala ghanami, wal yafiha ma'ari bukhra. When Allah Almighty asked Musa, what is in your right hand? He was trying to teach him something. Of course, Allah, uh, Musa alayhi salam, he loved to talk to Allah. He, this is the, okay, nine to one, thank you. We are here. Imam, uh, Ustaz Malik Pedri, we talked uh, with him. We made a program on with him on Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. He said, Allah is teaching uh, uh, gradual desensitization. First thing, because he will meet 
with the magicians of Pharaoh, they will come up with snakes. So he was trained not to be scared of snakes. When he had this stick, Asa, throw it, it became a snake. He escaped. He didn't turn back. So scared. So in Islam, you are allowed, uh, Allah allows you to be scared of snakes and mice and whatever animals, but you're not allowed to be uh, scared of enemy, for example. Chapter Anfal says you cannot uh, escape from the enemy except you can turn back your back to the enemy to go to another place to fight. You know, so it's a grave sin to be scared of from enemy. Look at the Holy Quran, this teaching or emotions. Actually, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to our emotions, we don't use Quran enough. The Quran is a compass for all our emotional life. What to love, what not to love, what to be scared of, you know. We are we, we must fear Allah. We must we shouldn't fear enemy, for example. So Quran is giving so much uh, information, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Islamic psychology, I'm not sure we use it in the you know uh, balanced way. So second class of men I talk, the third, the fourth is the worst case. They do evil things. And they advertise it. They are happy with that. They are advertising it. They are propagating it. This is these are the worst people. And uh, almost there is no cure for this last class. Brother Jamatun, do you classify your patients when they come to you in in your brain? So this tells you if you have too many people to come to you, then classify them. And uh, make some, you know, uh, priority list. First class is the men who don't know, unlearned people. They have better chances. And of course, you can talk to the worst class if you don't have any, any other customers. Okay? Okay. How to have good action, good conduct? He says, do the opposite. Whatever, you, know, you don't want to spend money, spend it. For your friends, be courageous. Okay, you are scared of fighting and stuff. I was joking. Join a gang. You learn. No, no, don't join a gang. No, they are teaching. I have seen a lot of documentaries in the UK. They are training horses. The horses are scared of sound, you know, gun sound and fire. But they train them. Even you shoot at them, they were not scared of it. Desensitize all the time. They see fire. They jump over fire. They, you know, uh, open fire the other things with guns, and they're accustomed to it. So you can, you want to scare off a horse, a police horse, in UK or in Turkey, in Malaysia. They are not scared of your voice or shouting or gun. They're accustomed to it, you know. So always do the opposite of uh, whatever emotion you want to have the balance. He said, as we treat heat with cold, someone has fever. What mothers do? I do it as well. We have this, you know, uh, some handkerchief and uh, apply it to the forehead. So the heat go away. Similar thing. So I think this is interesting. I don't know in psychology they do it. I doubt it. They most, mostly justify their bad conduct, you know. Okay, you can do it, you know, as long as you don't harm others. Keep doing it if it is making you happy, you know. So, of course, in Islam, Alhamdulillah, we don't have this. Ghazali is really uh, talking about nature and nurture. Uh, I would like to talk about, for example, nature. He's making a very good analysis of nature. I hope I can find it. No. He says, Man has four vices in his constitution. al the animal desires. al the aggressive desires. I'm going back. Shaitaniya, the deceptive inclinations. And Rububiya, Kibir, you know, monopolizing other people's wealth and, uh, you know, uh, showing Narcissism. When we look at Freud, Freud found the first one and he became very famous worldwide. He said, man has two 
motivations, sexual and aggressive drives. That's it. Just because of this, he became so famous. He became the father of like psychology. But Ghazali said, like a thousand years before him, Ghazali died, as you know, 11, 11. If I am not wrong, Freud 19 something, 1930 or something. Not too long. When Freud died, 19 something, yeah, yeah. So, so 800, 800 years before, Ghazali gave very detailed, very detailed uh, analysis of man's motivations, you know. Behemiya, even he said, you know, the first thing we do when we are born is uh, feeding. You know, our muscles are so strong. It's unbelievable. You know, in the mother's womb, the mouth doesn't work at all, but they are so powerful muscles. You know, the baby immediately, you know, uh, sucks his or mother. So this is our behemi aspect. Ghazali says, after a while, the child learns how to be angry. Like, the child doesn't become angry, of course. The first, I don't know, four or five months, the baby is okay. Then it starts getting angry, you know, when you don't rush to his knee. Of course, I have, mashallah, five boys. I have a video here. If I show you, I, you will have really mercy on me. The last three boys, everyone has something to hit each other. Everyone hitting each other, you know. They get angry with each other, you know. Or, or out of nowhere, you know. God, anger. Of course, we needed anger, you know. Shaitania is deception. You deceive people, you know. Shaitan was the first deceiver. He told, you know, Adam, you know, I, shall I tell you something, a secret between you and me? If it is three, you will be eternal. And Adam, alayhi salam, never knew that someone would lie. Because he was in paradise. Whatever someone tells you, it is true. No one told that lie so far. Some professors say like this. Therefore, immediately believed. And they ate the tree. So this is cheating is in our nature, you know. When you ask the child, who broke the glass? I didn't do it. You know. I catch my kids playing games in computer. When I, you know, look at them from a side, they say we are studying daddy. But they are not. They are playing games or watching video or something. When they turn their back a little bit, it is definitely playing games, you know. And Rububiya is the worst one, he says. Narcissism. As I said, narcissism is the, the worst sickness in psychology, even today. It's very difficult to cure the narcissist people, you know. And Ghazali has given very detailed, very long chapters on these poor vices. And he says, everyone is tested with some of them. Or mixture of them. He says, Every evil characteristic is mixture of these, you know, uh, vices. So some people are really very, you know, behemi. They want to eat and drink all day. And Ghazali says some people even, uh, you know, sell their country for a halwa. You know, this uh, betraying their countries. And some people have aggr aggression problem. They always get angry, you know, unlike Malaysians. And uh, some people are tested by their, you know, you're especially a tujjar businessman, very easy to make money out of lying, you know. Just one lie can bring you millions of dollars. Really, some very little lying, you know. And uh, if I am not wrong, Alhamdulillah, Indonesia became Muslim because of good uh, Yemeni, you know, businessmen or tuchar or whatever, sailors. They came and made business with Indonesia, maybe even Malaysia, isn't it? Because no Muslim armies came here. No Muslim armies came here to Malaysia. No Abbasi, no MMA armies arrived in. No, because you are so far away. Yeah. There are no there were no planes those days, you know. So, you know, decepting, narcissism, Ghazali is really giving very good analysis of our nature. And I, I have five boys, 
the first one is very halim. You know, you take his water, he will cry. The second one is so aggressive. I take his water, he hits me, he attacks me, you know, fights me all the time. Same parent, same house, same food, but nature is so different. You know, so all my boys are all different. Mashallah. But also nurture is important. <clears throat> if you're feeding them all the time with some meat, in this time, or person says, don't eat too much meat, you know. Eating too much meat is not very good. It makes you like aggressive. But also, if you become vegetarian, those are not very balanced thing, you know. So Islam is actually teaching us all kinds of things. There are so many so many vegetarian people in the West today. It's becoming a problem. They say don't don't kill cows, don't kill animals, you know. In Turkey we have a stupid lobby. Nur knows very well. We have dogs everywhere. Dogs come and eat you, but no problem. You can't hit them. You can't harm them, but if they harm you, it's okay. News of says so and so entered the dog's habitat. Come on. Turkey is always not dogs, you know. So look at the psychology of people nowadays. Unfortunately now there is a projection of love towards animals in the West. They don't want kids. <clears throat> it's a troublesome look after them so so long. But dogs and cats are nice. You can throw them in the street whenever you don't like them. People are projecting their love, motherly love, fatherly love onto these animals. And now in the West, of course, the you know families are going down. And uh, the population has, are getting less. Why? Because they are projecting this love into onto animals. So uh, I wonder why don't we have Ghazali, you know, institutions, Ghazali academies, Rumi academies, <clears throat> Ibn Sina, Abu Zid al Balkh. I don't know whether you have seen this. Masalul Abdam al Anfus. It's really beautiful. Somatic and psychosomatic sicknesses at the same time. Unbelievable book, you know. In history of uh, medicine and psychology, special place for this book. Because it discusses first the physical, physiological things which make you sick, and discusses the psychological stuff. So to be short, I think I've talked enough, Rumi, Azali has so many beautiful things to offer the psychological world. Uh, inshallah, uh, countries like Malaysia, uh, you know, should lead in uh, Islamic psychology. I know that Ustaz Malik Petri was here for some time, 20 years. Very long, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And last, his last three years, we were together in Istanbul. <clears throat> we started a project with him. How can we benefit? From the emotions of the prophets. The prophets show a lot of emotions in the Quran. Patience, anger, you know, impatience, everything. Love, fear. So we start this project. We made like three, four videos together. Then uh, he passed away, Rahimahullah. And uh, he was quite old when I met him, you know. And the six, the last six months, of course, he spent in Malaysia. I couldn't see him, but before that, I was with him. Alhamdulillah, I am so happy to meet him and you know learn from him. Shall I am planning to continue? How can we develop therapies from Musa alayhi salam, from Ayub alayhi salam, from Yaqub alayhi salam? When we you know get sad, can cry, no problem. In uh, our culture, I don't know what's the culture here. They say, man, don't cry. Yeah, that's toxic. But we never cry. Because they, if you cry, they say, are you a woman? Come on. Yaqub alayhi salam cried so much that he became blind. You can be sad, you know. You can express your sadness. But what did he say? He says, well, innama eshku basti wa huzni ila Allah. Same thing happened to all Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. When Ibrahim died, he cried. And the Sahaba said, oh, Prophet, do you cry for a little boy? But they don't, they don't care that much. Those days, people had like 10 kids, you know, many kids. 
I remember that is Asabi said, I have 10 kids, I never kissed many, any of them. And the Prophet said, you know, yes, my eyes cry, my heart is saddened, but my tongue doesn't say anything to displease Allah. So we learn the psychology of grief here. You're allowed to express your, you know, emotions. Don't hide your emotions. Express it, cry, you know, tell your story to your friends, share it, but don't complain Allah to his creation. So I just want to give some glimpses of my research from Ihya al uh, and from Ghazali. And there are so many, you know, beautiful uh, therapies that we can bring from these sources. And I believe, inshallah, Malaysia will be leading uh, as before. Now, I, in Islamic world, I find Malaysia and Indonesia very good in Islamic psychology. Of course, in the West, we have also some good brothers and sisters doing some, you know, uh, psychological research. But nevertheless, there is so much need and we don't have enough resources and researches. You know, the Western people are just publishing one thing. Like there is a British psychologist, I tie something, it's a Greek origin. He always talk about mindfulness. Oh, he organized courses. He have retreats everywhere, mindfulness, this mindfulness, that. You know, in Islam, in Sufism, for centuries, we had this. Ibn al-Waqt, he the son of the time. Don't think of, of the future, don't think of the past. Just carpe diem, focus, and we have about, you know, always. Also in Salat, what we do? You should always concentrate on what you read. So try to train your brain not to, you know, uh, go uh, astray. Always concentrate. We do it all the time, but we don't make it a paradigm. And a Greek, British psychologist do it, and he makes so much money out of it. I know I follow him. That's one concept, mindfulness. That's one concept by uh, Martin Seligman, the positive psychology. And I forget the resilience. Who was? I forget the name. Just resilience. Sabr, you know. In Islam, when you read Ghazali, he speaks details of sabr. So when it is sexually sabr, it is ifat. When it is in the army, it is bravery. He talks so many different layers of sabr. Same thing, you know. Some people are good in fighting, but not good in money, for example but not good with opposite sex. So Ghazali is discussing all this stuff, how to train ourselves, but unfortunately, you know, the Western uh, psychology world is developing this resilience and positive psychology and uh, mindfulness, and they are becoming, you know, something big. I thank you very much, and now, inshallah, maybe sister would like to make some comments and questions. Thank you answers. very much. Uh... Jazakallah khairan kathira, Prof. Sulaiman. Um, when you mention about uh, mindfulness and how we Muslim, we do not know how to promote. Um, I think maybe we are into zuhud, something like that. Zuhud, yeah, minimal, minimalist, minimalist, yeah. And, and those people, they are so good in self promoting themselves. Um, in a way, okay. So maybe. Um, in future, we are supposed to seriously commercialize our, yeah, we have to. I mean, um, not in terms of a capitalist thingy, but we have to uh, promote it well. Um, so when you, just now you mentioned about Rumi, and he's the one who teach about psychoanalysis, because all this while, you know, I've been learning about Freud, and I'm uh, in in my mind, he's crazy. I mean, reading about his background and whatnot, uh, somehow it it this uh, it doesn't trigger my mind that yeah, actually what he mentioned is true, that we have that sexual needs, we have that anger, we have that um, uh, um, in Greeks what we call the eros and thanatos in in Freud terms concept. Um, 
but how do we relate it in with our nature and Islamic teaching on how to balance it, which is very interesting. So um, um, we open for question and answers. Take this opportunity to ask questions. Any of you? Dr. Ratna, maybe? Psychologists. Yeah, I think maybe they still can't detach themselves in terms of try to decolonize their mind from yeah from being colonized, but especially by Western epistemology, because it's actually it's a a, a responsibility for Muslims, so-called Muslim psychologists, to detach themselves, try to decolonize from the Western epistemology, particularly particularly in this discipline of knowledge, psychology. So what's your thoughts on this, Miss? Thank you. I get I go back to my this is here drawing. You know uh, ontology is here. We are creation of Allah. Allah created us. So we need uh, you know his commandments and uh, when it comes to you know uh, learning about how to worship and stuff or emotions this field is close to you know western and any other foreign uh, culture because we only learn from Quran and Sunnah but here yes we should decolonize but we should also learn from anyone because as I said the Hikma is lost property of a believer even if he's in China take it Actually, this is how to get a miracle because Chinese are very good in now inventing things, you know. You buy everything from China, isn't it? Sorry? Cherry. Yeah. I, I listened about the Chinese car, cherry. I don't want to make advertisement. So even that is has so many, mashallah. Whatever the person says, it comes true. May Allah give them hidayah to Chinese people and make them Muslim, inshallah. So this field, sister, yes. Actually, here as well. Oh. This is very bad. Now, many people say psychology is an ilim. What's the place of religion in it? It is just, you know, observation and drugs and everything. So we should forget religion. And Ustaz Malik Bedri said, as there is no Muslim aspirin, there is no Islamic psychology. This is big, big false in my understanding because uh, nafs is from Allah. Uh, ruhi, ruh is from Allah. So this thing we only learn from Quran. This part we should decolonize most of the information, wrong, false information we receive from the West on nature of man, aggressive, and as I said, sexual. Yes, we have this, but we can control them, you know. An animal cannot control. An animal is hungry. It's every anything, you know. So we are different than animals. We can control our desires and urges. I think, as you said, we should decolonize Freud and any other harmful psychologist from our uh, epistemology. And we must develop our own epistemology, which is Quran Sunnah, plus observation, plus test, you know. But we cannot say we don't need Quran and Sunnah. But there are times our brain cannot solve the problem. Like, as I give the example, LGBT in the West today, they came to a point, they said this is logical. Why? Because we have these genes, these inclinations in our brain. I was giving this theta healing. Have you heard about theta healing? A Canadian lady invented this. She just says, uh, close your eyes and talk to your creator. Somebody, they're all prophets, mashallah, in the West. They talk to shaitan. Or they talk to their, we call it, we call it hadith of nafs. Or nafs talk with us. So you talk to your nafs. My nafs tells me, go and eat something nice. Then you do it, you become happy. Oh, I talk to God and, you know, this is not, uh, you know, uh, therapy. Just follow your desires. I agree with you, sister. We should decolonize so many things from our psychology. Now, I am fighting this, for example, healthy boundaries. Now, Everyone's putting boundaries everywhere. In Islam, 
This is a very delicate issue, you know. When you read these Western psychological books, it's very logical, yes. You tell your kids to cook their own food and clean, your, clean their rooms and everything, put boundaries around. But when you get old, they will leave you alone. You will be very healthy uh, boundaries of by yourself in your own house, dying by yourself. I mean, Islam is all about mercy, you know. Yes, brothers. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I just wanted to add a reflection on what Hujam and Professor Suleiman Darin said and taught us, mashallah. Thank you, Professor, for your amazing mm -hmm. lecture. Thank you, Professor Haslina, for opening up this place for us. Uh, thank you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for this. Now I woke up. <laughs> Allah Akbar. Please forgive me. This is actually very interesting because modern production of tables and chairs are not like the asal, which was something that was very stable and that could hold for thousands of years. You know, so this is psychology of chairs and production. When industrialization, uh, industrialization and mass production comes over, then things break very easily. Uh, actually, uh, one of my teachers, Dr. Omar, he mentioned to me that Ibn Arabi said that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave uh, wisdom into the mind of the Greeks, into the uh, tongue of the Arabs, and into the hands of the Chinese. So the Chinese were very known for building beautiful things with their hands and craftsmanship. Uh, please forgive me, Brother uh, Ustad, for uh, I will clean this up later. Um, I just wanted to reflect upon decoloniality because decoloniality is very important. Very important. Uh, but it shouldn't be an ideology it's a tool because what has happened with the coloniality today is almost like some people make it into ideology and this is only the aim we have but we need to also understand what do we want with the coloniality what is the aim of the coloniality and the aim should be to reconnect with fitra and to revive islamic thought because franz fanon which is one of the great decolonial thinkers i'm sure you have read his book you know the black skin white masks or the rich of the earth he was an amazing scholar, but he was not spiritual. He didn't believe in Tawheed. And uh, there is a great Iranian sociologist, I'm sure you have heard about him, uh, Ali Shariati. Uh, Ali Shariati actually uh, sends a letter to Franz Fanon saying to him, I love what you're doing, but you have lost one thing only. There is one point you are not reaching to the transcendental level, equally to Abraham Maslow, or Ibrahim Maslow, he said, Hoja, Ibrahim. we're Islamizing all these scholars' names. Uh, he never comes beyond the naps. So his transcendental doesn't take you away from the ego, so he doesn't take us full stop, right? Uh, the same goes with Franz Fanon, and Ali Shariati says to him, uh, in order to get uh, human to their fullest potential, even after we have achieved the decolonial project, we need Tawheed, right? So uh, what I have noticed in decolonial movements, and I, I'm very interested in it, I think it's very important. I am very interested in decolonial psychology. I think Franz Fanon's work are very important for us as Muslims to understand, is that it still doesn't bring us to the fullest picture. And sometimes we have the tendency of making decoloniality or other uh, types of uh, you know, uh, philosophy as the aim, rather than as a mean to reach the aim. And the aim should be to reconnect with fitra, because uh, also with the coloniality, if we don't do it properly, can also come things as a result, which will take us astray from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which also Hojam is referring to with normalization of liberal ideologies, uh, secular ideologies, etc. Uh, in the end, we as Muslims, we're not against white people, for instance. We, are re we reflect upon whiteness as something that is a social product, which could be something that can create a race hierarchy and racial hierarchies. Of course, we are against these type of notions, but we also know that many of the great scholars of the past and in our presence uh, are white and are you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon. Uh, we also have learned from the past that if we don't deal with our uh, oppression in a healthy way that we actually release the oppression so that it doesn't become frozen, then the oppressed can become the oppressor as well. And that's why the prophetic model is that, you know, as, as much as possible, while you're doing jihad al-dunya, also do the jihad al-nafs. So when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave fath to the Prophet sallallahu when he came into Mecca, he didn't go and uh, start to oppress his counterparts who oppressed him 
and his companions. Rather, Allah gave an uh, avenue for them to do tawbah and they were forgiven. So I think that the complexity here is very important. Obviously, as you guys are from Nusantara, which is a place was which was colonized by the Dutch and by the by the British, we need to decolonize, for instance, reconnect to our traditional scripts and Javi, right, which was written in Arabic. You know, when a person, they say that when you take away the language of a person, you take away the person's identity and psychology. This is what we have seen in Turkey uh, when Latinification of the language became a part of uh, the way of, uh, you know, understanding and learning. The same we've seen in Caucasian countries and also here in Nusantara. This is decolonization. But then the aim should be Tawheed and Fitra. And in that, I really recommend myself, first and foremost, that we always go back to the aim. Uh, because I've seen in so many decolonial movements that the aim has been only decoloniality. But what happens afterwards? You know, uh, so that's just a reflection from my side. Thank you so much for your question. Good. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you very much, um, Brother Jaludin. Um, anybody else who would like to pose a question? Yes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Gassi, uh, Prof. Linda. Jazakallah khair, Prof. Sulaiman, for the enlightening uh, talk. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, I was looking forward uh, since the the topic for your talk this morning, given by the organizer saying that you might compare Al Ghazali and Rumi, yeah. So I'm looking forward uh, to hear more about Rumi, yeah. Um, in fact, I think uh, it happens in most of the, our students. I'm from UKM. Uh, they they focus more on Al Ghazali, especially on the Yah Mulmudin, uh, compared to Rumi, yeah. Um, I don't know why. Is it because of it's it's a bit uh, difficult to understand Rumi? Uh, probably it's because of its deep spiritual to understand compared to uh, Al Ghazali, which is I think more to fake muamala and so on, which something practiced. I mean, practical as for for us in Malaysia. Um, but I went to Konya once with my friends, yeah, and I watched the. Uh, the Sama and it really uh, inspiring since I'm a creative writer as well so I wrote a few uh, short stories about this uh, setting um, I, I personally feel that it's very uh, purifying you know uh, when we were there watching the movements and the focus by the dancers so I hope that I wish that my students in UKM also they will study more on Rumi uh, since we have few theses uh, written about or inspired by Al Ghazali, you know. Um, in fact, I read one book uh, by Brother Hamza. Uh, Yus yeah, uh, Hamza, Hamza Yusuf. Yeah, the purifying of the heart. Yeah, I think he focused more on Al Ghazali as well. Yeah, um, I don't know why. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very interesting book, right? Yeah. Uh, you talk about heart disease as well as the solutions, yeah. So I'm looking forward as well. Might probably, Prof. Lai might, might write a book <laughs> uh, regarding to that kind of topics uh, regarding to Rumi's uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the reason why Ghazali studied so much is Ghazali is very clear and, uh, you know, very organized everything is there you don't have to have too much headache to understand him but Rumi is a poet he writes everything everywhere like for example he made commander of the Quran almost one third of the Quran so I myself now writing a book almost finished I have uh, collected all the translations and commanders of the Quran and made a tafsir of him Quran, by him he don't write the tafsir, but he has tafsir everywhere. So he has psychology everywhere. And the good thing, he gives the message through stories. Let me just one example. Because I didn't talk enough about Rumi. A young man from Kazvin in Iran. You know, in Kazvin, there was a 
custom that wrestlers had tattoos on their shoulders, you know, to even look powerful and more stronger, you know. A young man, he was not a wrestler, but he, he wanted to seem like a wrestler, came to a tattoo shop. He said, you know, can you make me a line? And the tattoo maker said, what kind of, you know, line? He said, a roaring lion, a fierce lion, you know. He said, okay, sit down. He had, you know, pins. And, you know, they inject the pins and uh, inject the ink under the skin. That's how they do. Tattoo, of course, it's haram in Islam, by the way. Don't try it. It's just for the sake of giving a lesson, you know. When the man started, the tattoo maker, a tattoo artist started making the lion, the young man screamed, what are you doing, uncle? You are killing me. He said, son, you said, you want a lion? I started with the tail, you know. He said, can you do it without, without a tail, please? I don't want a tail. It's so painful. It's hurting so much. You are killing me. He said, okay. And he said, let me make the, you know, half of the body, the upper half. He pricked the needle again. The young man again, you know, jumped to his feet. What are you doing? You are killing me. He said, look, son, you ask a lion. I am doing it. So which part you are doing now? I am doing the belly. Do it without the belly, you know. I don't want the belly as well. He said, okay, sit down. This time again, same thing happened. What are you doing? He said, I am doing the ear. He said, please, don't make the ear. The tattoo artist was very angry with this young man. He said, go away from my shop. Allah never created a lion without a tail, without a belly, without an ear. So he's giving the lesson, you know. You ask something for, you must pay the price. You must be resilient, you know. Now, some psychologists say, these self-development people say, just think so about something that will happen to you. Uh, everything, every day I think I am very rich, I am very rich. The last 20 days I think I am rich, it doesn't happen. They get all kind of psychological manipulation and stuff. Rumi has so many stories. Uh, one thing is very beautiful about narcissism. There was a lover and beloved. The lover came and knocked the door, said, and the beloved asked from inside, who is it? He said, it is me. She said, there's no place for two persons in this room. So small room, go away. And the lover went away. After a year of lamenting and being sad, came back, knocked the door again. She asked, who is it? And he said, it is you. So if you are not two, and two person, one body, or, you know, uh, in the house, there is no marriage, you know. You and me, all the separation creates problems in the marriage, for example. So, so many beautiful stories. Uh, I'm trying now to collect these stories. Uh, I use them in my class, and they really big students uh, very eager to learn about Rumi. But because he's a poet, as you said, difficult to learn. You have to uh, sit down and read it, you know, discuss it, and read commentaries. There are very big commentaries of Rumi, like this thick, six volume, 25,000, uh, what you call it, lines. Couplets, I mean, not lines, couplets. So 50,000 lines. On top of that, we have D1. So it needs a lot of courage and, you know, time and dedication. Thank you. Another two questions. Um, first one from Sana Norain. Any specific zikr to Muraqaba that can help with regulating negative emotions? That is one. Another one by Sister Nulaila. Assalamu alaikum, Prof. I am Laila Tool, a student res researching the concept of divine love through Rumi's text, Fihi Ma Fihi. If you don't mind, could you share how Rumi's psychological views on the women, for instance, involve the role of women in life? So, this is very important. Women, love, and then the other one is Zikil. Actually, in Murakaba, yes we try to control our thinking and our thoughts. Now, Noor and we are studying together contemplation in Buddhism. They are very well known for controlling their brain and thoughts, which is not true. They say, like, just watch your thoughts like clouds going and don't intervene, don't defend yourself, let them pass, kind of things. In Islam, actually, when you read uh, books like Ghazali, uh, like Ibn Jawzi, he really has beautiful theories, just like Khatr, 
comes to your mind first time, as a thought. And of course, in Islam, the thoughts might come from shaitan. The modern psychology doesn't know about it. They don't believe in shaitan. Something comes from shaitan, they think it's natural. Oh, it came to my mind, it is natural. No. It might be satanic thought. It might be angelic thought. It might come from your nafs. And when we were discussing, you know, this with Ustaz Malik Pedri, he gave the example. Sometimes you have dreams. Like you are fasting, you are so thirsty, and in your dream you are having ice cream. Is it shaitanic? No, it is nefsani. So your nafs really wants to taste it, you know. But you find yourself naked and, you know, people make mock of you, mock you, and this is from shaitan. So shaitan loves to play with you, you know, uh, and make you sad. Or in your dream, you saw some waliullah, they tell you good, good advice about something, you know, you wake up, you are so happy. These dreams come from, you know, Rahmani dreams, you call it. So like thoughts are like this. In Islam, we know the map of the thoughts coming from where. And uh, for example, uh, you know, Ibn Javzi says, when you have a khatir, don't follow it. If you follow it, it becomes like an irada, a will. Then it becomes an action. And you repeat action, it becomes a habit. Beautiful, you know, you can. So if you want to, if you don't want to, like, let's say, some bad habit to occur, don't follow it in the first place. You follow khatr. It becomes will. You follow your will, it becomes action, and after it becomes a habit, very difficult to correct it, you know, to choose it. So, don't go bad places, for example. If you are going to a pub and try to contemplate about good things, can you do that? You must go to a masjid, you know. But so what are you doing in the first place? Yes. You know, there's something else, but you know, for positive influence, you choose your good friends, you know, you have good circle of friends. It's very important, you know. Thank you. Ah, zikir. Oh, I love zikir. Wow, wow. Zikir is really, to control your brain, you must fill the gaps. You shouldn't let your brain become free to do whatever it likes. So what Sufis do? I forget my super today. I told, oh, no, yeah, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. I thought I forget it. So when you are in the car, you know, pushing around, say, Allah, Allah, la ilaha illallah. So don't let your brain wander around and stray and, oh, look at this, oh, beautiful picture there. You know, there is something, oh, yeah, there's good pictures here. But in Istanbul, unfortunately, they are putting all these naked women around, all these advertisements, you know, and they are doing all purpose. You open your internet, all underwear. Are people always buying underwear? I think they are doing it on purpose. Just to make our brains think of, you know, all this bad stuff. Those who pay so much money just for underwear on the street screens, I think they are satanic, satanic people, you know. They don't want to advertise what to sell. They want to change our thinking. So we find naked, this is okay. In Turkey, unfortunately, Nur knows very well, when you drive your car, all these, you know, big boards, billboards, they have all kind of stupid advertisement, not, not anything normal, always immoral. So they are trying to control your brain. So when you say, Allah, Allah, la ilaha illallah, Allahumma salati na Muhammad, you are uh, not letting your brain, I love this in the book of uh, Ustaz Malik Pedri, our brain is like a mill. If you put wheat, you got flour. And you can make dough and bread. If you put sand, or if you put rocks, he says, into your brain, and what you get is sand. It's no good. Sand, what you will do with sand, you know? So always we put good thoughts into our brain. When you say, Rahman, Ya Rahim, you understand mercy of Allah. Then you contemplate about good things. So zikr is a precautionary action of ibadat, first thing. But forget about this ibadat. What's the benefit of psychological stuff? It's a precautionary action to prevent to prevent your brain 
to go and wander and have uh, bad stuff, you know. So zikr is very important. So Sufis always tell you, as Imam Shafi said, I think, if you don't make your nafs engage with haq, it will engage you with battle. That's the, you know, important thing in zikr. Yes, please. Divine love needs another lecture. Yes, divine love needs another lecture, isn't it? We have also slides here in this computer. Don't worry. But it's a really long thing. For Rumi, love is the center of everything. Allah created us in love, so we must worship him in love. The center of all relationship with other people also love, not hate. Look, there are so many Islam movements today, Daesh. Well, because you have glasses, Bida, chop off it. You know, so sad. They were killing people. Allah was there and they push a people and kill him. So when people here in Azam, in the West, they think some people are killing some other people. So they all hate. So when they say kill someone, this Daesh, shoot someone, kill someone, they say Allah was there. So then you hear Azam, what do you think? A Western person. Think, oh, some Muslims are killing some people somewhere. Look, what is this hate? Is a lot of you know Islamic movements today. They always discriminate. Oh, you have something different. You're not from us. You know. Uh, so I think love is a very important concept. And concerning women, uh, Ibn Arabi and uh, Mabdana has a similar philosophy. Uh, in the beauty of women you love, it is the beauty of Allah. Allah is manifesting. So a uh, Gnostic says, And one is women. But women, we love it in a spiritual way. That's what he says. Not like animalistic way, as today is the Western culture are propagating us, you know. There's no love. It is just, you know, short time happiness or what has. So uh, Rumi and Ibn Arabi and Muslims are speaking how we can reach from Layla to Mabla. I have written an article. From Layla to Mevla. Does it make sense? From Layla to Mevla. Does it make sense? So this is the summary of my uh, divine love. From Layla to Mevla. You love Layla first. Then you understand uh, there is better love, which is Mevla. I just wanted to to reflect upon um, because I speak Farsi. So actually, Professor Darin, me, um, oh, do you hear me? Uh, I, I speak Persian, I speak Farsi, so I am from Iran. And uh, Hojam and I were going to do Rumi therapy together, inshallah. And we have a lecture that we did in Australia about that. So essentially, there are some misconceptions with regards to the notion of love and also the notion of um, being intoxicated, you know, in, in the, in the Misnavi. Uh, we have a Persian word which is called mast. Mast means masti means to be intoxicated. But because of the, as Ustada said, a, a translator is a traitor. They say, <laughs> so the translation from Farsi to English has taken away the Tawhidi notion of some of the terminology of love and also of intoxication, and and, and taken away Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from the equation. So people think this is intoxication of dunya or of you know, you know intimacy or. But this is actually mustallah, which is fanafil Allah. It's like to annihilate your ego, you know. So we need to be very cautious of uh, reading the translations of Rumi. And also, uh, they have sexualized Rumi's uh, viewpoint of uhuwa. Uh, uhuwa means brotherly love. And inshallah, we will speak about utuwa this uh, two weeks. So uh, the love that Rumi speaks about is a manifestation of a brotherly love that is a murabat, a heart to heart connection between a sheikh and a murid in the embodiment of the relationship between Shams Tabrizi and Rumi. But the Western uh, notions of translations and also the, the, the sickness that it does, uh, exists in the secular realm has sexualized it, inshallah, uh, which essentially uh, is to uh, dismiss Rumi's uh, tawheed and Rumi's uh, preferences to, to follow the sharia and follow the sunnah, right? So I think that we should be very reflective upon uh, what uh, Rumi means of divine love is something that is very much congruent with Quran and Sunnah and that 
Ukhuwa doesn't mean that we sexualize it. If I give a hug to my teacher, it doesn't mean that I want to do anything more than just giving a hug, you know? So I think the Western paradigm has uh, sexualized our thoughts of brotherly love and added components that actually makes it very difficult for us to hug each other today because even we subconsciously have internalized that. So it's a good reminder for all of us. I also wanted to just, with your permission, Professor and dear Ustad Ustadas, tomorrow we're going to have a lecture in Muka Cafe at 8 a.m. You're all most welcome, inshallah. Um, uh, Professor Darin and myself are going to speak about the psychology of the prophets and how to deal with trials and tribulation from an Islamic psychological point of view. It's free, so you guys are welcome. I have a QR code here to our WhatsApp group and ISIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology. I'm going to pass my phone and you scan it and uh, join our group and you will get more information, inshallah. And you all are more welcome to join. So I will pass my mic uh, uh, starting here, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. In Rumi, we have a lot of drink and, uh, you know, drunkenness. But I will read a poetry from Ibn Farid. Sharibna ala zikri al-habib budamatan وَسَكِرْنَا بِهَا مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يُخْلَقَ الْكَرْمُ Understand, Professor? We have drunk and mentioned or below it, but that time uh, we became drunken, but that time wine was not created. It is like خَمْرِ uh, azaliya, divine love. So always Sufis talk about drinking alcohol, but it is metaphorical. It is uh, love, uh, you know, Drunkenness in divine love. And when British invaded uh, India, they read Sufi books and they found all this masti and stuff. And they said, look, we are also Sufis. We drink alcohol and we become drunk, you know. They thought these are all, uh, you know, real sense. But it's all metaphorical. So love is the very center of Rumi. Unlike Ghazali. Ghazali, I think, uh, justice, you know, I don't know, uh, knowledge are the center of his philosophy or psychology. Yes. From Australia. Wow, uh, Australia. Thinking about how do you find a Tazkiya Shirk? Tazkiya Shirk? What did he say? Tazkiya Shirk. Ha ha ha. Tazkiyah Sheikh, I see, I see. How do you find a Tazkiyah Sheikh to practice Tazkiyah to Nafs? Of course, it's difficult. You know, you will ask your friends. You, uh, how, when you are sick, before you are okay, you never ask, like, oh, let's say, uh, a brain doctor. Why? Because if you are okay, healthy. But once you get to have some problem in your brain or in your ears, then you start asking people, you know, do you know someone who knows this and that very well? Then you look at the products as well. Imagine a doctor always killing his sick people. You never go for operation, you know. So uh, there are good people around in Islamic world. But of course, serious people should ask and search and uh, then find a sheikh with, uh, you know, a Sufi master or guru, what you call it. And then, uh, you know, of course, check his credentials. Whether this man has produced good, good product or has done some bad things, you know? Because nobody is unfortunate. There are a lot of pseudo-Sufis around. They just dance and, you know, sing, and they say we are Sufis. So we should be careful. And uh, then we should follow whatever they say to us and be submissive. This is uh, something discussed a lot, I know. Because human nafs, we never submit to each other. We want to be, you know, by ourselves and free and Never listen to others, you know. But Sufis uh, think that we should be submissive to our masters, to our teachers and sheikhs, and listen to them. But of course, as Brother Jamatun said, a lot of concepts are now, you know, uh, changed and abused, unfortunately. Uh, we don't follow people, we don't want to listen to ulama. So, inshallah, uh, this brother or sister, I don't, I don't know his name, brother, yeah, uh, there are good people around. Just need to ask. Of course, also the, the one more thing: you should find a tariqa which is in alignment with our nature. There are different tariqas with different people. You know, inverse, uh, extroverts—they all have different tariqas. You know, so we should 
uh, choose and uh, find a good tariqah. Naqshbandi are for certain people, Qadri are for certain people, we have Rifa'iyya, Jarrahiyya, so many tariqah. So I think they're all therapies, different therapies. You know, you should, you should choose the one which is best for you. It seems like from the questions, I realized that everybody is looking for a prescription for their, for their, you know, heart. Uh, for so what what you are just uh, saying just now is you know just look for the right person. Yeah, yeah. Listen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to to accept prescription, also we have to be. A learner yes. too. And before we end this session, I would like to uh, inform all of you that we will be having another session, this time with um, Brother Jamaluddin. Uh, on the 1st of August, this this time the topic is very interesting. This one is interesting. This Another one is interesting too, which is from... From being a boy. So, from boys to men, from psychological point of view. Okay, so I think this topic is very much needed, especially um, now. You know, I've been saying that um, one of my students, my PhD student, is saying to me, um, he's a Nigerian, okay, and there are other brothers, um, Malaysian brothers too, and he told me, why I cannot find men in here? You, you get what I mean? What I mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so you are welcome to our next session on the first of August. Inshallah, the poster of it will be uh, shared with you later. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin, wa salatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-musaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Sulaiman and all of uh, all of our um fellow friends uh inshallah um hopefully whatever being given today is of uh, of a benefit to us and we can share it with other members um so thank you very much again thank you very much prof uh, asida and of course to the guest speaker as well prof sulaiman next we're going to have a uh, presentation of souvenirs and with that I would like to call upon Prof Hasida again uh, to present the souvenirs to Prof Suleiman. And we also have another one more souvenirs to Brother Jamaluddin. Please. All right, with that um, presentation on civilians, we have come to the uh, end of our event this morning. On behalf of IPSAS, again, we would like to uh, say thank you very much to our guest speaker, Prof. Dr. Sulaiman Darin uh, from uh, Marmara University. And uh, we also would like to say thank you very much to all our guests physically and also online or viewing with us on online. Thank you very much. And inshallah, we'll be seeing you guys again for the next coming knowledge discourse probably on the 1st of August. All right. So, wabilai taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you. We're going to have a uh, photo session outside, inshallah. <laughs>